Christmas messages in the month of December. We'll have one more next week as we finish our Christmas messages and we begin to look into the new year. But we continue this morning. This is our Christmas celebration here on December 24th as we behold the Lamb of God, Jesus our Savior. A wonderful, wonderful gift to each one of us. And this is what we're going to look at this morning. Would you join me? Let's take a moment. We've, we've been doing a lot of things. Let's just settle our hearts. And just as we come into the presence of the Lord again to receive the gift of his word, his living word into our lives, let's, um, let's still our hearts before the Lord this morning. Amen? Amen. Lord, here we are. And we come first of all before asking for anything and we say thank you again this morning. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the family of God here at Lighthouse. Though we are imperfect, Lord, we thank you for this family that is a family of love and care, a place where we feel at home. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word. You have not left us on our own, but you've given us your word as a foundation. You've given us your spirit to give us life and breathe life into your word. And you have said that you are with us always, even to the ends of the earth. And we're really grateful. And now this morning, we do ask you, Lord, for something. We ask you to open our hearts, open our thoughts to what you want to say to us. And God, help us to have hearts that will respond to you, Lord, that will be open to what you want to say to us and how you want us to respond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Is the sound okay or is it a little bit echoey, isn't it? Is it just me? It's okay. Okay. I want you to consider with me this morning the various groups and individuals that are part of the Christmas story that were brought in. Nobody is part of the Christmas story by chance. You know, sometimes we think, oh, as we said last week, oh, well, Anna just happened to be there. She walked, you know, uh, she walked up just as Simeon was speaking, or Simeon just happened to be there, or the shepherds, they just happened to be out on the fields that night, and God decided to do something really glorious and, and, uh, and bring angels in the sky, and, and the wise men just happened to be looking at the right part of the sky to see this star or whatever it was. The Bible says star. We'll find out exactly what, um, what astronomical phenomenon it was when we get to heaven one day. Um, they say a star. Uh, they just happen to be looking and they happen to catch it. But when we come to the things of God, and especially when we come to the Christmas story and the arrival of Jesus in, in fleshly form, in a body, to take on our humanity, to be one of us, to live with us, to live for us, to die for us, and then to be raised again. Nothing is by chance. Nothing is by chance. And so we're going to look this morning, and we're going to focus on one particular group. But th think with me, of course. Mary and Joseph, uh, the mother and the earthly father, of course they were involved, right? There had to be a mother and an earthly father for this baby that was going to be born. It was a necessary part. Then there was Zechariah. We've talked about this before. Um, was Zechariah absolutely necessary? He wasn't. Zechariah, in some ways, was a side figure to the, to the Jesus, to the Messiah who would come, and yet he is part, God included him, made him part of the story of Christmas. Um, that He was his connection as the father of the one who would be the herald. Someone is coming. And in those days, when an important person came, and when a king came, or when a king passed through in, in Israel, always earlier, there would always be someone who would go ahead of the king or the important person. And the person who went ahead would say, make way, and they would announce who was coming. Well, that's what John the Baptist did. And so we see his part in it as well. And Zechariah, as the father, his part as well. He receives the... the Although his heart is really tied up with my son, this, this son that's going to be born, he was still part of that whole flow of the Christmas story. He's a prayerful and godly priest, and we know that from, uh, from looking at, at the Word. So he becomes part of the story of this miracle child. 
The wise men become part of the story through the direct revelation and understanding that there's a sign in the sky and he is the God of heavens and the earth, the stars, the seas, the skies, everything. He orchestrated it. He brought it to be. Um, I always imagine I don't know if it's true, but I think so. I think Kenneth and Letty must be really interested in that part of the story, right? That's right. He, Kenneth said, yes, that's right, because Kenneth and Letty are amateur astronomers. They, in fact, maybe even more than amateur astronomers. They go all over the, the place. They went to the U.S. for the, for the uh, recent uh, 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 total eclipse of the sun and various things like that. But I imagine those two are quite interested in, well, exactly what was that star? What was it like? How did it move? Things, things like that. And maybe they could tell us even more than I can tell you this morning. But the wise men come through this revelation and direction of a special star, and they bring gifts that are suitable for a king. Now, we're not going to talk about the gifts this morning, and we're not going to talk about these, all these other ones so much. We're going to focus instead on a different part, uh, a, some different people in the story, but that's how they are brought in. And Jesus was a king, and so it's fitting that wise men come and they bring kingly gifts kingly gifts. And it had to do with, you know, the gifts, if you've heard messages about that before. There are all sorts of other things related to that as well. And then we come to the shepherds, and actually the shepherds. The shepherds and sheep are what we're going to talk about this morning on this Christmas, um, on, in this Christmas service. And to me, it's quite, a, it's interesting because we have all of these various groups, but in fact, of all the groups that we've, that we're talking about, after Jesus is born, the shepherds are actually, they're the first group to get the news. They're the first group to, to receive the announcement that a Savior has been born, and uh, he's a special one sent from God. And they're the first group to hear, and so I want us to consider this morning why God would involve a group of shepherds. Shepherds in general in Israel did not have a high reputation. They were often the youngest ones or the oldest ones. Um, do you know in, uh, in Jewish culture and in Jewish history, I shouldn't say history, in Jewish culture and daily life, that shepherds were considered so unreliable, they were not allowed to serve as witnesses in any court of law. Did you know that? They were considered unreliable, they were considered sort of untrustworthy or whatever. That was a general reputation. And so, why are shepherds included in this story. And so we're going to look at some scriptures this morning that help us see what God was doing, because it's not really about shepherds, and it's not really about sheep out on a hillside. It's about the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. And so that's the way we're going to go this morning, and I invite you to join me as we look at the Word of God. And we turn first to John chapter 1. And this is John, probably the youngest of the, uh, of the disciples that followed Jesus. As far as we know, he was the youngest one. Um, and John, the one who was, uh, so John is the one who writes about this, and he writes about a different John, right? Okay, so John, the disciple, is writing about John the Baptist the son of Zechariah, <laughs> okay? And so, John the Baptist, the one who was born to prepare the way for Jesus and to serve as his herald, announces very clearly one day, when Jesus is about 30 years old, he says, as it's recorded in John chapter 1, John saw Jesus coming towards him. He was baptizing people. And what does he say? He says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. A very dramatic statement. Look, the Lamb of God. And when it says look, what it means is pay attention. If you've got uh, NIV or perhaps uh, King James, it says behold, the Lamb of God. And I've used behold, the Lamb of God. So he sees Jesus coming towards him and he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The very next day, we see a few verses later, he was there again in the same general area. Two of his disciples were with him. Do you know who one of the disciples was at this point? One of John the Baptist's disciples at this point was this John, okay? And he's the one that's writing. So that, that it starts getting kind of whatever, but it makes sense, doesn't, doesn't it? 
And so he sees him again. He's there with two of his disciples. And we read in verse 36, when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. Now, a simple and straightforward and rational explanation for shepherds being included in this story of Christmas is that the Lamb of God was born. That's, and, and I think it's not a stretch at all to say, well, that's, that's why they were included. And that is why they were included, I believe. There are other reasons as well, but that's the easiest place to start. That's the, that's the most simple place to start. The only child, the child that is sent from God that is born that night is the Lamb of God. Do you know that this expression, the Lamb of God, is only used two times in the whole Bible? The whole Bible. And it's used by John the Baptist, who is the herald, the announcer, the preparer of the way. And he's the one who says, it's the Lamb of God. It's the Lamb of God. Now, if you go all the way back to Isaiah, and if you look at other places, if you move forward and look at what Peter writes and what Paul writes, and then what John writes in the book of Revelation, later in these other places, earlier and later, you will see that the Messiah who is coming is talked about as a lamb. He's talked about as a lamb. But the only place that Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God is here by John the Baptist. One day and then another day. And it's said here. And so we look at this because if there is a lamb, there have to be shepherds, right? If there's a lamb, there have to be shepherds. Always. Always. And so we see, next slide, because of his love for us, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son his lamb, his only son, and the gift of God to the world that came at just the right time. God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law, and God sent him to buy freedom. We looked at this verse last time. Do you remember that? Last week we looked at this verse as well. And so the gift that God gives was his one and only son, a lamb, the lamb of God. I was listening to John 3.16 this morning in a different translation. And in a different translation, in John 3.16, it says this, God showed his love to the world in this way. In this way. It's not just, I love you, I give you a lamb. Here, have a gift. But God showed his love, and his love was wrapped up in the gift that you and I must have if there is going to be any hope for us at all. No other gift would do. No other gift is good enough. No other gift will satisfy except the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's why for me, my verse this Christmas has been, thanks be to God for his gift too wonderful for words. Thanks be to God. That's one of the reasons we're, gonna be, we're going to be beginning 2018 with this gratitude journal as we respond to the Lord. So we look at this. No person had ever been called the Lamb of God before. I want to ask you something. Have you ever read the Bible or looked at something or heard something and revelation came to you, and for the first time you saw something or you understood something about God or about Jesus. Has that happened in your life? It should have happened in each one of our lives, right? Can you, Matt, do, can you remember? Keith just raised his hand. He was one of the first ones, and Helen was well. Do you remember what it felt like? Do you remember what was happening in your heart and what was happening in your mind? And I want you to think of that morning or that afternoon or whenever it was, maybe it was afternoon, when John the Baptist says, look, the Lamb of God. And he doesn't stop with that, but he says, who takes away the sin of the world. They had never heard that before. It had never been preached before. It was not written in the Old Testament in the law anywhere. It was not in any of the prophets, never before. 
had those words been uttered in any temple, in any synagogue. But when John the Baptist said those words, everybody knew what he meant. Everybody understood the importance and the significance of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why? Because they were all Jews. They were all under the law. They all went to the temple. They knew what a lamb was. They knew what a lamb meant. They knew how a lamb was to be part of their daily lives. They understood and they knew, though it was the very first time. It's like, oh, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They all lived under the law and they knew what a lamb was used for. The blood of a slain lamb was the Passover offering that would protect them from the judgment of God. They all knew that. Every single Jew celebrated Passover every single year. And so when John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, immediately one of their thoughts would be of the Passover lamb who was perfect, had to be perfect, right? And the lamb was slaughtered and then the blood was put and he, and he protected them from the judgment of God. Not only that, because they lived under the law, they also knew what the lamb meant. The lamb was the sin sacrifice. And let's look at the, the next, let's look at the, the next ones. First of all, they understood it's a protection from God's just judgment. And I've, I've condensed a bunch of verses in Exodus chapter 12. If you want to read a, more about the Passover lamb in the Old Testament, go to ex, Exodus 12 and 13, and that'll tell you a lot. There's a lot more than that, but it's there. And the, God told Moses to tell everybody, select an ant. Uh, I'm sorry. That's not D. That should be Ann. <laughs> My fault. <laughs> okay. Select an animal from the flock and slaughter the pot, Passover lamb. Take some of the blood. And we, we know about this part. And what does he say? When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now today, 2,000 years later, we look with hindsight. We look with the understanding of the Holy Spirit and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we know exactly what that means, don't we? We know that when God looks at you and when God looks at me, as imperfect as I am, his judgment does not fall on me. His judgment does not fall on you if you have received the blood of the Passover lamb and it has been applied to your life. And he sees the blood and he passes over and there's no judgment. That's why it says in John 3, 16 and 17, for Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world or to judge the world, but that the world might be saved. That's what the Passover lamb does. The Passover lamb brings salvation to everyone who accepts, who takes the Passover lamb and the blood of the Passover lamb. And we understand that. But for them at that time to understand, oh, well, there's a Passover lamb, but here's the lamb of God. And you can imagine what was going on in their thoughts and in their minds. So it was a protection from God's just judgment. But even more than that, look at the next slide. Look at the next part in Numbers. And this is um, several different verses as well. Everybody who heard John say, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world understood even more that the Lamb was a sin sacrifice. It was a sin sacrifice. Everybody understood that. Do you know why they understood that? Not just once a year at Passover, but every single day of a devout Jew's life, man or woman, boy or girl, they understood in the morning at the temple a perfect lamb, a spotless lamb, one that has no mistake, uh, no, nothing blemished in it. Nothing, it's a perfect lamb. It will be taken to the temple and it will be slaughtered and its blood will be spilled and it's a sacrifice for sin in the morning. Every Jew, man, woman, boy, girl, understood that every single afternoon a perfect lamb would again be slaughtered and its blood shed on the altar and then burned, completely burned. What for? 
as a sin sacrifice every day of their lives, every morning, every afternoon, and twice on the Sabbath. There would be an extra along with other things as well. And so when John the Baptist says, behold, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, they all understood what that meant. He's a sin sacrifice. He's a sin sacrifice. And those that had a heart understood or began to understand, although it was hard to comprehend, that here is a person, not a, a lamb in the temple, that lamb in the temple, that's my sin sacrifice, morning and afternoon, every day of my life. That's my sin sacrifice. But John said, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And those who had an open heart and a desire for the Messiah to come began to understand the gift of God that was a lamb, that was a lamb. So they understood that. They understood that. Every Jew also understood that the lamb that was sacrificed had to be completely unblemished. So that said something when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, that had to say something about the life of this man, Jesus. They didn't know him as divine. They didn't know him as the Son of God. All they knew at that point was, then his life is perfect. Because if he's going to be a lamb that takes away the sin of the world, there can't be anything wrong with him. There can't be anything hidden. There can't be anything shaded. He's a perfect sacrifice. And so they understood that. Now, let's go a little bit further because we're talking about sheep and shepherds. We're going to get to that. You say, well, we're talking about lambs now. Stay with me and we'll keep going a little bit further. When was the sin sacrifice of a lamb offered in the temple every day? We just read in the verse that we just looked at that one lamb was offered in the morning and the other was in the evening. But it wasn't that general, brothers and sisters. These were called the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. And it was two exact times of a day. Do you know when it was? In the morning? Exactly at 9 a.m. In the afternoon? Exactly at 3 p.m. Inside the temple, if you go back to Zechariah, while the lamb was being slaughtered, do you know who was, do you know what was happening inside the temple? While the blood was being put on, that was the lamb was slaughtered and the blood was being put on the sin altar outside, inside a priest was offering incense on the altar of incense on the inside, exactly the same time. So Zechariah, when he was offering that, it would have been at nine o'clock in the morning or three in the afternoon when the angel appeared and announced that his son would be a herald and that the Messiah was coming. That makes it pretty special, doesn't it? And so the sin sacrifice was nine in the morning or three in the afternoon. But much more meaningful to you and to me is as we think of the Lamb of God, not just a lamb from the fields of Bethlehem surrounding Jerusalem, but the Lamb of God. And let's look at the next slide. Look at Mark. Then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. To, to get the picture, when was Jesus crucified? What festival was it? It was the Passover festival. Remember the Passover festival? When the blood is there, you won't be judged. I'll see the blood. So Jesus, the Lamb of God, is crucified on the Passover. But look even more specifically. Oh, God puts everything together in a beautiful way. They nailed him to the cross at what time? Nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. So he is crucified at the time of the morning sacrifice. Why? Coincidence? Chance? No. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then, a little bit later, verse 34, then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? Why have you abandoned me? Because of our sin. And then he uttered another loud cry and he breathed his last. So he's crucified in the morning at nine and his work is com completed and he's finished. What time in the afternoon? 3 p.m. At the time 
of the afternoon sacrifice. Why? Because he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Oh, brothers and sisters, when we hear this, and when we, some of you may have heard this already, it may be so familiar to you, but to me again, it stirred my heart with wonder and gratitude and thanksgiving for this gift of God that's too wonderful for words, for the Lamb of God that has taken away my sin. I don't want to just say the sin of the world. That sounds too big out there, right? He's taken away my sin. He's taken away my sin. And that's why... I can go freely into the presence of God. And so can you. So can you. And so this morning I say to you, behold the Lamb of God who takes away your sin. You say, oh, pastor, you're talking about crucifixion on Christmas morning. Shouldn't it be more joyful? It is joyful. It is wonderful. It is, oh, we, it is part of the worship and the worth of our Lord on this Christmas celebration service this morning. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away your sin, who takes away my sin and the sin of the world. Truly, thanks be to God for his gift, too wonderful for words. It's no wonder that the shepherds are part of the birth. It's no wonder that shepherds are part of the Christmas story. But you know what? It gets even better. And let's look at a few more verses. Let's look at the, the, the part of the Christmas story that you and I know so very well. This is, um, I, I don't know about you, those of you that have families, even if you don't have families, I encourage you, make this part of your Christmas tradition. I remember so very well from even my, as a small child in Singapore, you know, back when I was a child, we only had the King James. So you can imagine. Uh, and there were in those days shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And suddenly, I still remember it in the King James. Why? Because with the lights low and the Christmas lights on and all of that, I would listen as my father or my mother read the Christmas story from Luke chapter 2. And probably I, and probably you as well, you probably haven't memorized at this point, don't you? Do you, Pastor? Yeah. yeah. He goes, yep, <laughs> right away. It's a wonderful Christmas tradition if it's not yet part of your Christmas tradition. It's not, it's not too late. But this is a, a part of the story that we know so very well. There were shepherds, and I've, I've specifically chosen a, a very modern translation because I want you to see some things maybe that you haven't paid attention to before. Notice this says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields ne nearby. And that's a little bit different than what we think about, right? We think of shepherds, shepherds that go out into the fields and they are just out there for a short time at night. They're, they're taking care of their sheep and then they go back home and they whatever. But that is not what this says when we read this. It says there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. We know the story, don't we? An angel appears. They were terrified. But the angel says to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Hey, guess what this morning? That announcement that was given to the shepherds that night so, so long ago, although you and I were not there to hear it, that announcement was for us, right? That it will be for all the people. So, hey, I bring you good news of great joy that is for you this morning. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, I just read, I just quoted to you the King James, but you can read it there as well. And so, as we look at this, I want you to think as we go a little bit further. Jesus has just been born. The first people to get the announcement are the shepherds who are out in the fields. But I want you to see that the angel doesn't just stop with the announcement. I think that's important for us as we, look at, as we look at the Christmas story this morning. The angel sent from God doesn't stop with this wonderful announcement. Yay, a Savior has been born for you. Look at what happens next. Look, as we go a little bit further. Then the angel says, this will be, and then just stay right there, Michelle. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Okay, as I used to tell my students when I was teaching really young students, put on your thinking caps, okay? Um, if the angel says this, is this just an announcement, or do you think the angel wants something? Does he want some action from these shepherds? 
Sure, he wants some action from them, doesn't he? He says, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So here's something for you. It will be a sign. If they were just going to stay out in the fields, they wouldn't need a sign. They already had the angels. That's pretty great. But he says, here's a sign. You will find a baby. The angel expects action from them. The angel expects them to leave their sheep in the fields and to go to the baby. So we see this, and then let's see if that is indeed what happens. We already know the story, so we know what happens next. The angels had left them, they'd gone into, and they'd gone into heaven. The shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Now, I have a question for you as, uh, as, we, as we look at this. Um, how many of you know your way very well around Hong Kong? You barely need Google Maps anymore. I tell you, I rely on Google Maps, and sometimes Google Maps fails me in Hong Kong. <laughs> fails me. The other day, I drove around in Tai Kok Chue for an hour just trying to get back to uh, Tai Po. <laughs> yes, an hour, Chris, because they've changed the roads in that area what, you know, where they're doing construction. And I was trying to find out how to get there. So here's a question for you this morning as we look at the story. My question is this. The angel says, here's the sign you will find the baby. So he expects them to go look, and they do go for the baby. But the angel does not give specific instructions, nor do the shepherds ask for more details, right? Have you ever thought about that before? Now, Bethlehem was not a large city or a large town. It was in some way a, almost a suburb of Jerusalem, which would have been very large. But Bethlehem, according to archeological records, uh, and archaeological finds and discoveries was, was somewhere between 300 and 1,000 people. So that's not that, that tiny, between 300 and 1,000 people. And that's before all of the visitors have flooded the town because of the census. They had to return to their homes, right? So Mary and Joseph are part of that, part of that group. The angels don't give any more instruction than that. And the only people who get that sign are the shepherds. The wise men don't get the, the sign of, this will be a sign to you. It's very, very specific. He says, you will find the baby. And the shepherds don't say, oh, wait, angel, Gabriel or whoever it was, since you've come all the way from heaven to bring us this news, would you go ahead and give us the street address, please, <laughs> of baby Jesus, so that we don't have to waste our time all evening looking for this wonderful baby has been, that has been born. You know, we, we just tell us where he is, tell us the street and the house, and we will go directly there. But the angel doesn't give them any more details, and they don't ask any more details. Why not? because there was no need for either. When these shepherds heard that this sign was for them and it was a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger, they knew exactly where to go. They knew exactly where to go. And here's some scriptures that we're going to look at. Um, let's look at the... So they, and, and, so they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. No, quite, no part of the story says, and they looked and they went from door to door and house to house and said, can you tell us where, where is a pregnant woman in Bethlehem? But you know what? There's no, they could have asked for a pregnant woman. Most people would not have known because Mary and Joseph were, were guests. Mary and Joseph had just arrived. So if they were asking for help and knocking on door to door, they might not have found. But they go there, and as far as we can see from the story, they just go right to Mary and Joseph. They go to where Jesus is, and they see, as they say, the baby who is lying in the manger, just as the angels said. So let's look at some other verses now that help us to understand. Okay, let's look at the next slide. Set aside the shepherds for a minute, and Let's talk about sheep for a little while, okay? Let's, how many of you have been around sheep very much before? Not, not very much. I've been around just a little bit. Um, and probably, but probably I wouldn't want to be a shepherd. You know, it's not, a, it's not the loveliest, nicest job in the world. It's, it can be rather messy and, and smelly and, and so forth and so on. But I want to talk about sheep for a little while. And I want to talk about the sheep of Bethlehem as we think about the Lamb of God and as we think about these shepherds this morning. You see, the fields of Bethlehem and the sheep that were raised in the fields of Bethlehem were very special sheep. Now, later on, John 
The Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There were sheep throughout Israel, but the sheep of the fields of Bethlehem served primarily one purpose and one purpose only. The sheep of the fields of Bethlehem were the sheep that bore the lambs that had the possibility of being used for the temple sacrifices in Jerusalem. The perfect sacrifice that was offered at Passover and the daily sacrifices that were offered morning and afternoon every single day. Those sheep came from the lambs that were born from the sheep of the fields of Bethlehem. So it was special sheep. Ah, oh, now when we start thinking about that, we start to get chill bumps just a little bit, don't we? When you start thinking of what God did. The other beautiful, beautiful part about Bethlehem and Jesus being born there is what the name Bethlehem means. And we don't have time to go in that. But do you know what the name Bethlehem means? Some of you may know. Bethlehem means house of bread, literally. And the fields of Bethlehem also, they were famous for growing grain. Remember uh, Ruth who gleaned in the fields of Boaz, the ancestor of, of Jesus? Why? It was famous. It was a, it was a grain growing region. And so Bethlehem is called house of bread. How fitting that the bread of life who came down from heaven was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. But not only that, here are these sheep that were so special, the lambs were born and raised for the daily sin offerings. Every spotless lamb, every spotless lamb that was born in the fields of Bethlehem was destined for the temple sacrifice. And if it was a male lamb, it was, it was destined for the sin sacrifice. Even female lambs, now it was primarily male lambs, but even female lambs would be used, uh, would be used for, for sa other sacrifices as well. But the sin sacrifice was always a male lamb. And that makes sense, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He gave his one and only son. And so the shepherds who took care of these lambs in these fields were also specially trained shepherds, different from the other shepherds of Israel who took care of their sheep differently. These shepherds stayed in the, sheep, in the fields with the sheep all the time. They would take turns, but they were always there to take care of the sheep so that nothing would happen to these special sheep, so that nothing would happen to these special lambs. When the shepherds say, let's go to Bethlehem, do you know that in the original language, they don't exactly say, let's go to Bethlehem. Do you know what they say, actually? They say, let's go to the edge of Bethlehem. That's what it is in the original language. Or let's go up to Bethlehem. Do you know why? Because there was something special at the edge of Bethlehem. And as shepherds, special shepherds for special sheep that would be used for a sin sacrifice, they knew what was there. Look with me all the way back in the Old Testament. These shepherds would know what Micah said. Look at the next one. As for you, O watchtower of the flock, O stronghold of the daughter of Zion, the former rule will be restored to you. Kingship will come to the daughter of Jerusalem. And then in Micah 5, 2, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one for me, will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old. So when we look at this, and when the shepherds say, let's go to the edge of Bethlehem, this was where they went, the watchtower. I won't go into all that, but there was a special name for that. It was called Migdal Eder. You say, ooh, are you that smart? No, I'm not that smart. I just looked it up um, in, the, in the original Hebrew. But it specifically meant the watchtower of the flock. And it was a tower. And here's where it gets even more special for us as we think about why shepherds were part of that first Christmas. 
these shepherds, when lambs were born, when the sheep was, were about, when they were about to give birth, they would take the pregnant, the ewe, the, the pregnant sheep, to the watchtower, and the lamb would be born there. No other place. No other place. It would be born there. And then these special shepherds, to protect the lamb and to keep it from injuring itself as a newborn lamb if it was moving about or if it fell, they would take strips of cloth and they would wrap the lamb tightly. And they would take the lamb and they would put the lamb in a manger. And so when the angel says, this will be a sign to you, you will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger, every shepherd knew exactly where to go. Every shepherd knew it's the lamb for sacrifice. It's the lamb that will be used for sin offerings. And so they knew where to go. And they understood. It's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They understood that before John the Baptist ever had to say, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As shepherds who were trained to take care of lambs that were destined for sacrifice, they knew what it meant when the angel of the Lord said, this will be a sign to you. They knew Old Testament prophecy. They knew what it meant. They knew what it meant. The Lamb of God would be spotless. And the Lamb of God that would truly take away the sin of the world, the Lamb of God that takes away, that took away and that takes away your sin and my sin, was born in exactly the spot that the lambs for sin sacrifice were born and were wrapped in cloths and then were prepared for the temple sacrifice. Is that where the shepherds find Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Yes, exactly, exactly. They find him exactly where the angel says they will find him. But the shepherds have one final task, don't they? Look at the next one, Luke 2, 17 and 18 and 20. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. And they returned glorifying God. Remember what I told you at the beginning? Shepherds had a really bad reputation. They had such a bad reputation that they couldn't even testify in the courts of law. Not these shepherds. These were special shepherds. These were shepherds who knew the Old Testament, who knew the Word of God. These were shepherds who understood that the one who was born in the manger, wrapped in cloths, would be the Lamb of God. And that's why it says, all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them, and they glorified God, praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which was just as they had been told. God wanted not only angels to announce the birth, God wanted shepherds to announce the birth of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is what Peter writes as we come to a close this morning. In 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, this is one of my favorite passages as it talks about the Lamb of God. He says to Christians, for you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed. Redeemed means bought back from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's why we say, this Christmas and every day. Thanks be to God for his gift too wonderful for words. Brothers and sisters, I urge you this Christmas to behold the Lamb of God who takes away your sin and my sin. Amen.
Amen. Would you stand with me this morning as we close?